Well, welcome to the AMET Scientific Hydration in the Workplace webinar. You'll see from the presenters' backgrounds that they are eminently qualified to discuss this subject, so I'd now like to hand over to Dr Graham Bates and Ben Tarbucks, who are in our Western Australian office. Uh, welcome to the webinar. I'm just going to run through a little bit of the science of hydration and heat stress. Uh, as Peter mentioned, if you've got any questions, please save them until after the presentation. I'm only too happy to go over some of the things. So we'll just get started and talk about, first of all, the uh, importance of temperature control, the importance of hydration, how we assess hydration status, and how can we measure heat stress. So they're the topics that we're going to cover today. First of all, the body is required to get rid of excess heat to maintain constant internal temperature. Now the body temperature is 37 degrees. It's the most protected physiological mechanism in the human body. And the reason for that, which not many people know, if you go to 39, 40 degrees, it's life-threatening. If you go down to 34, 35, it's also life-threatening. Hyperthermia means higher than normal, hyper, hypo, less than normal. So why do we protect 37 degrees? Well, it's because all of the cells in the body are optimal reactions occur at 37 degrees. Any variation to that temperature, and you're going to get the chemical reaction slowing down, significantly. So if the body goes to 38 degrees, you get about a 20% decrease in the chemical reactions. So the chemical reactions are optimal at 37 degrees. Now any variation to that is going to significantly decrease the physiological ability of our bodies. So that's a really important point. The first one is that 37 degrees is the most protected mechanism in the human body. Any variation or deviation is going to be life-threatening. Up to two degrees is going to be life-threatening. So just bear that in mind that, that the body is going to, to do everything to maintain that 37 degrees. <coughs> okay, we're just going to the next slide. The other thing that is worthwhile mentioning is that muscle contraction is very inefficient. So 90% of the energy that you use when you contract a muscle is going as heat energy. Only 10% or thereabouts is actually going to contract that muscle. The rest is going as heat energy. So when you start working, sitting down doing nothing like we're doing now, is going to use very little heat. There's very little heat generated because there's very little muscular activity. The minute that you start using the muscle, then most or 90% of that energy is going as heat energy. The point that I'm making is that as you increase your workload, you significantly increase your heat load. The same thing with the car engine. About 70% of the petrol that you put into your car is going to get be heat energy. The 30% is going to push the pistons up and down. So it's, again, fairly inefficient. And that's why you have to have coolant to take away that heat that has been generated by the friction in the motor. The same thing is the blood in the human body. We have to have the blood to take away the heat when it's generated by the muscle when it's contracting. So heat storage. So when you work or exercise, just to put that into context and to summary, you produce a significant amount of heat energy, and that must be lost to the environment. It's especially true when the environmental temperature is above the body temperature of 37 degrees. So if you're working in 39 degrees, it becomes very difficult for the body to get rid of that extra heat. And the only way to lose heat in that circumstance is by sweating. So bear in mind that when we get to or generate a lot of heat by working hard or when the environmental temperature is above 37 degrees, the only way to lose that heat is by sweating. So how does heat alter this mechanism? 
Well, when it's a very high humidity, it decreases the evaporation of sweat. And so therefore no heat is lost. So when sweat drips off the skin, or when your clothes get wet, you're not losing any heat. There is no heat loss, because the sweat is not being evaporated into the environment. So when the humidity is very high, say 90-95%, then the atmosphere is saturated with water, and therefore it won't take up the sweat from your skin from a liquid to a gas it won't evaporate into the atmosphere. So no heat is lost. That's why if you're working in a very high humidity environment, you don't lose heat, because it's not going from a liquid to a gaseous state. So therefore no heat is lost. <coughs> the other thing is that muscular strength declines due to increased blood circulation to the skin. So when you get hot, the circulation is going to be sent to the skin in order to get the sweat to the skin to evaporate it. So muscular strength declines because all of the blood is going to the skin, not to the muscle. It results in a decreased flow to muscles. So again, it is compromising the muscle because again, you're going to send the blood to the skin to protect that temperature. The temperature is going to be protected above all other functions in the body. So overheating decreases alertness and mental capacity, again because you're going to send the blood to the brain, not to the muscle. Okay, so what happens when you work in the heat? Thermal stress results in sweating. Sweat evaporates, producing cooling. All sweat comes from the blood initially, so increased sweating results in a decreased blood volume. So that's a really important point, which we will now just um, go over in summarisation of that in terms of dehydration impact. So if blood volume decreases, you become dehydrated. Blood volume will decrease due to sweating. There is a less blood available to go to the skin and the ability to dissipate heat is lost. So in other words, when your blood volume decreases, there's less blood available going to the skin and therefore the heat loss is going to be compromised. So your temperature is going to rise. It stands to reason that your heart rate will increase because there's a smaller volume. So you're going to get fatigue. Blood volume to the gut is going to be reduced. So you're going to absorb less fluid. Less blood is available to the working muscles. Therefore, they're compromised as well. And a very important point is that mental capacity is compromised due to the fact that you've got a decreased blood flow to the brain. That means decision making can be compromised. That's extremely important when you've got somebody that's doing um, a job that requires cognitive ability, like a crane operator or somebody that's on heavy machinery. A mistake can be either fatal or loss of limb, etc. And many industrial accidents have occurred as a consequence of that. So mental capacity is compromised. You are more prone to accidents and injuries in those circumstances. So dehydration, I just want to, some of the research that we've done just to go over that to um, illustrate my point. It's the singest, single biggest cause of heat illness. So dehydration without doubt is the single biggest cause of heat illness in industry. Thirst, and I probably most of you have seen this uh, before, that thirst only starts at about 2% dehydration of body weight. So you've got to start drinking immediately. You can't wait until you're thirsty. Sweat rate can reach up to a litre per hour. So over, the, over a shift, you can lose between six and eight litres of fluid in a day. In a week, you can turn over your body, body weight. So incredibly, uh, it's a significant impact to the human body when you're sweating in a hot environment 
there is a phenomenal turnout of uh, sweat from that, compromising the body. Our research has indicated that about 40% of workers come to work dehydrated. So I would imagine that uh, most of the people tuned in here are occupational health and safety officers. I would put money on the fact that 40% of your workers have gone to work dehydrated today. It's a major problem in industry. We don't drink enough fluids. And uh, Ben Tarbox will talk a little bit about that uh, shortly. Aim for straw coloured urine. I think a lot of uh, posters up in toilets, etc., show this that aim for a straw coloured urine. And drink so as to urinate frequently. In other words, four times a day at a minimum. So the frequency of urination will give you a reasonable idea, and the colour of the urine will also give you a reasonable idea. Uh, this slide is fairly complex, and I haven't got a pointer, but if you look at the line down below, so you wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and you can see that they're roughly about a litre under, a litre under the uh, new hydrated state. In other words, they've come to work slightly dehydrated. So when they start working, they keep sweating, and it's not until they get to about two to three litres under optimal levels that they start drinking. In other words, that they now realise that they're slightly dehydrated and so they start drinking. And if you look at the graph, you can see dehydration levels during the shift. They remain dehydrated and they're not going to get you hydrated until about 6 o'clock. In other words, they are working the entire shift in a dehydrated or compromised state. So once you start dehydrated, Generally speaking, you stay that way for the entire working shift. And that's a fairly important scientific research finding that we've uh, discovered over the years. Okay, other factors that can cause dehydration. I'm just about to take a, a drink myself, so excuse me. Fly in, fly out. Western Australia, we have a couple of hundred thousand workers that are flying and fly out. They uh, we're a big state here, so often those aircraft are flying for two to three hours, going up to Broome or beyond, Kununurra, around there. It's about a two to three hour plane ride. Your breath, when you breathe out, is 100% relative humidity. So every breath that you breathe out is 100% relative humidity. It's saturated. When you breathe in, in an aircraft, it's about 20%. So an aircraft has got a relative humidity of about 20%. So when you're breathing in 20% and breathing out 100%, you're losing fluid every single breath. And there are 15 breaths a minute. So you're losing about one to 200 mils an hour sitting on an aircraft. So when you get to your destination, you're somewhat compromised. The other important thing is that when you're in an air-conditioned donga up on mine sites, you're also, that's it's called evaporative air conditioning. So in the morning, when you've been breathing in about 25% relative humidity from that evaporative air conditioner, and all of you know that when you can listen to the air conditioner in your dongas or in your camp, you'll hear drip, drip, drip as the uh, air conditioner takes the fluid out of the air and drops it outside. That's how it works. So your air is extremely dry and you're breathing out 100%. So in the morning when you're working on a mine site, one, you're going to be dehydrated when you wake up. A very important point that not many people understand. You'll have a dry throat. Um, and often when I work on mine sites, that's exactly what I experience. I wake up, I've got a fairly dry throat throat simply because we've been uh, breathing in very dry air all day, all night, sorry. So summary, the best way to maintain blood volume and therefore your capacity to maintain your 37 degrees is to prevent dehydration by maintaining fluid intake. Now, we all know about a radiator of a car. We make sure that it's topped up if we're going across the Nullarbor or to a long drive we make sure that our radiators are full. And that's the same thing that you should be aiming when you're working in the heat, maintain your blood 
volume to its optimal level. The minute that you start getting compromised fluid levels, it means that you don't have the amount or the capacity of the body to take the heat from the working muscle to the skin and to get rid of that heat from the body. So if you're compromised, if you've got a less than optimal blood level, then you're going to fatigue a lot quicker. The bush way of finding out whether or not that you're dehydrated, try and spit, and if it dribbles down your chin, you're dehydrated. So try and spitting, not now preferably, and if you're dehydrated, it will dribble down. I just want to go through a couple of things here by way of a, a break from the academic talk that I'm, I'm giving. Um, you can see here two tennis players that are well recognised, Krajicek and um, Agassi, and two guys, very, very fit, extremely elite athletes, yet one of them, look at him, sunken eyes, absolutely saturated, done. He can't go on, he has to retire. So people have got different capacities to tolerate heat, and one of those differences is sweat rate. So here's a cricketer that uh, was at the WACA. He came from Tasmania, he's a Tasmanian cricketer. He had to have 14 litres of saline. He collapsed, he was on the border of heat, um, not heat illness, heat stroke, and he was very, very lucky to uh, stay alive. So the point that I'm making here is acclimatisation. He came from, Australia, from, from Tasmania to Western Australia. He was unacclimatised to the heat. He didn't have a culture of drinking, so he didn't drink. And as a consequence of that, um, he became very de dehydrated. Children uh, have got a surface area nothing like an adult, so that they're extremely vulnerable to heat stress and somebody left a, a child in a car with no air conditioning while the mother went off and uh, gambled at the local casino here and the child died within two and a half hours of being locked in a car in WA. So uh, if you've got a dog very close to the pavement, uh, very small surface area, they'll get heat stress. If you've got a toddler, then they will get heat stress very, very quickly because of the surface area. Uh, Pat Rafter. We all know that he was an extremely good uh, tennis player. He had an extremely high sweat rate, three and a half litres an hour. Rahul Dravid, the cricketer, also 3.5 litres an hour. Very, very difficult to actually play tennis or cricket when you've got a sweat rate like that because you can't consume enough fluids to go back in. So some people have a very, very high sweat rate. Uh, this Chappy was in South Australia, didn't keep up his fluids, and he died uh, only 39 years of age. He died after about four hours of being in the field playing cricket in South Australia. Not in exceptionally high conditions, but again, dehydration. Um, the other thing is that if you have, and I don't want to get too technical here, but you, you have the major electrolyte in the blood and in in the fluid surrounding cells, not in cells, but surrounding cells, is sodium. And you must maintain the sodium levels at a certain uh, rate. In other words, between about 139, 140 to 144 millimole per litre. Now, if it goes down, then you get a condition known as hyponatremia. If it goes up, hypernatremia. So if you drink a lot, if you're sweating, and I'll go through that in a minute, but if you're sweating profusely, you are losing water as well as electrolytes. The major electrolyte in the blood is sodium, so you're losing sodium. So when you drink water, you're effectively diluting that compartment. And there have been a number of deaths as a consequence of people drinking too much water, and therefore they're diluting that sodium concentration in the blood to the point where they've got hyponatremia. Hyponatremia will kill you. It's an extremely, uh, it's a medical emergency effectively. So when you drink too much water, and some of these diets that people get, say drink lots of water, what you're doing is actually diluting that fluid compartment. If you're sweating profusely, that can get the sodium levels to the point whereby you've got hyponatremia. 
Um, this fellow did the same thing. He drank water when he was on an uh, ultramarathon and he, he suffered brain damage as a consequence of drinking a, enough water to dilute that sodium compartment in the blood and in the cells, sort of around the cells. The uh, fluid around the cells got hyponatremia and brain damage. Again, very, very quite common uh, condition. Okay, so the important thing is sweat. As you can see there, a sweat gland, and by the way, that's what sweat looks like on the skin. Not a very uh, good look, is it? So let's now talk about what is in sweat. And as I said before, you've got mainly sodium. Now sodium, you can see this, the cyclist on his pants, around the back of his pants on the, uh, on the seat, that's all encrusted salt. So sodium is the major electrolyte that you're losing when you're sweating profusely. That's the Hawaiian Iron Man some years ago. Okay, so the important thing is sodium, as you can see there, 40 millimole per litre. Now I get that from the research that we've done. We've probably put more people in an environmental chamber and measured their sweat levels um, and what's in sweat than any other laboratory in the world. We have come up with that figure, 40 millimole per litre, that is the medium level. Uh, some people sweat at 20 millimole, others 60 millimole. Once you get to 70, 80, then you're effectively into the area of cystic fibrosis. But the, look at potassium, 3.5 millimole, because potassium is the electrolyte inside cells. So when you sweat, you're not losing potassium. You're losing that sodium because it's coming from the blood and from the cells surrounding, uh, from the fluid surrounding the cells. Note that, and this is really important, magnesium, zinc, calcium, any other thing in sweat, no, there's none. So what you should be concerned about is the sodium. The sodium is the major electrolyte that you're losing. You are not losing magnesium, zinc, calcium, or any other electrolyte from the body when you sweat. Okay, so this gives you some idea, just a, a ballpark figure. We put people in the environmental chamber and we measured their sweat rate for six hours. We uh, found that they're losing around about on a normal exercise level or, if you like, work level that can be maintained throughout a shift. They're losing around about 600 mils an hour. So in 10 hours, given breaks, etc., approximately six litres lost in a day. And um, that's an important figure and one that you should remember because that's effectively in the summer what your men are going to be and ladies are going to be losing at sweat. Note that this environment was about 35 degrees and 50% relative humidity. Note, so not excessive, but um, pretty much representative. And again, look at the major electric like sodium, we measured that sodium loss is around about 40 millimole per litre per hour. So if you're working for 10 hours at a rate of about 600 mils, losing 600 mils, you're losing around about 5.52 grams of sodium in a, now that's sodium. Note that it's 5.52 grams of sodium and that means sodium chloride is going to be 13 grams of salt. So the figure may be a bit confusing there, 5.52 grams is the sodium loss, but sodium chloride, which is salt, is going to be 13 grams lost in a day, about three teaspoons loss. So sodium then, is it's been around for a long, long time. Um, some of you may know that the word salary comes from the Roman uh, name for salt. So salt, in Rome, and the Roman word for salt is salary, and that's where we've got the word salary from, because soldiers used to be paid in salt, not in money. It was such an important commodity that they paid their soldiers, thus the word, you're worth your salt, and the other thing is that's important is that all staple diets, regarded whether or not that you eat rice, pasta, bread, they all have salt. That's why in Australia our major salt and water was the uh, basic diet of prisoners for a lot of years. You'll stay alive because you've got glucose in the bread and you've got salt in the bread. And it's by no accident that every culture in the world 
has got pasta rice bread because it has got salt and it's got glucose. Okay, so what should you drink when you're in the heat? Water's okay, um, but people tend to get sick of it. And if you've got a good diet, it will replace most of the salt in the diet. So we're not saying, okay, if, you, if you're happy to drink water, then drink water. If you can drink six litres of it, fine. And if you can do it every day, that's even better. But, and if you have a normal diet where you've got salt, uh, then that's going to replace the salt lost. Sports drinks, they're too high in salt and sugar. Um, so there are far too many kilojoules in it, not appropriate. Cordial, 10% sugar. So if you are going to use a rehydration drink, uh, be very diligent when selecting it. Make sure that it has got the correct formulation. And again, uh, Ben will talk about this in a few minutes. So if you are going to use one, do it properly or not at all, because you're going to compromise rather than enhance the health of your workers. Um, Red Bull, all of these drinks, don't use them. Simple as that. Uh, if you use caffeine, it will increase your metabolic rate. If you have an increase in metabolic rate, you're going to have an increase in heat. Stands to reason. If you drink coffee, notice that your heat will go up. Your body will feel hotter. Now, Red Bull and all of these bee drinks, etc., have got a huge amount of caffeine in them, and they're totally inappropriate for people working in the heat. They're inappropriate for drinking at any time, but um, particularly if you're working in the heat. So if your cafeteria or, or whatever supplies it to the men after work, I, I would suggest that you think about uh, eliminating that. Okay, can hydration be tested? Yes, it can. Specific gravity of urine is a very simple, takes less than a minute, and it requires a, a very basic piece of equipment in order to measure the specific gravity of urine. So, um, yes, it can be tested. And that shows you basically the level. So what you're, what you're looking at is between 10 and 15, so one point. 0.10 to 1.015 is what you should be aiming at. If you can go below that, that's great. But anything above 15.20, you are hypohydrated and clinically you're dehydrated at 1.025. You are clinically dehydrated. Okay, long-term health effects of heat stress. Kidney stones, which are commonly known as renal calculi. There's over a million Australians that have got or suffer from renal stones. And so if you're drinking, if you're not drinking, it means that your urine is very concentrated. It's going to be dark coloured rather than that straw colour that we talked about before. And if you're in that situation, then you are far more likely to develop renal stones. So if you're drinking, then it flushes the kidneys. You're getting rid of all of the electrolytes and all of the other uh, toxins, if you like, that are going to stay, renal calculi are mainly formed from calcium carbonate, so it's getting rid of all of the calcium which is going to accumulate in the kidneys and form a stone. So flushing out the kidneys is what you're after to do. So again, by urinating, you're getting rid of those uh, components which can form stones. Also, cancer of the bladder has been recently reported for people who are chronically dehydrated. So if you stay dehydrated day after day after day, you're more prone to CA of the bladder. Other effects when you have full strength cordials, etc., kilojoules, therefore fat and your body weight will go up. So again, avoid too much of those. Climatization is a physiological process. So when you are exposed to the heat, for a minimum five or six days that you get a physiological process occurring which is going to make you far more efficient uh, when you're working in the heat. So your blood volume is going to go up by about 30%. That's significant. If you think about a radiator or your blood volume, 25 to 30% is a huge increase in blood volume, which means that you're far more efficient at getting rid of that heat putting the heat to the skin and evaporating that heat by sweating and allowing the liquid to go to a gas. So blood volume 
goes up when you acclimatise. Uh, you become more efficient in taking the blood to the skin. There's more efficiency. The blood, the sweat onset is earlier, and your ability to reabsorb sodium. In other words, an acclimatised person loses far less sodium when they sweat. The heart rate will go down because your volume will go up. So when you're acclimatised, you are far more efficient. People that are coming from cold places, Tasmania, working fly in, fly out, they're going to come to work somewhat compromised. They're going to, for the first day or two, be somewhat compromised. Likewise, when people have been ill, they are going to be compromised because they've, not, they've lost their acclimatisation. So be mindful of that where people are coming up for, from cold regions to hot regions, then they're going to be unacclimatised and therefore far more prone to um, being unacclimatised and heat stress. Air conditioning, there is a tendency for, uh, shall we say, uh, lunch, sheds, etc., to have down the air conditioning as low as possible. Not a good idea because it means that you're going to get vasoconstriction, which means that when you go back out into the heat, you're going to be compromised. So aim for around about 25 degrees. Don't have it down to 20, 17, 18 degrees. It's far too cold, which means that you're going to get a thermal shock when you go back out into the heat. So air conditioning, again, is very dry air, so you're going to be losing fluid when you're breathing uh, in and out. So Again, keep it not too low so that it's going to suck out more of the fluid from that air. Assessment of the environment. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about what must we measure and why. So we've moved away. I hope that I've convinced you that hydration, hydration, hydration is the way that you're going to stay healthy uh, in the heat. And now we're going to turn around and say, well, how can we measure the environment? What can we measure in that environment? and what tools are available so that we can assess the risk. It's a risk assessment. And at the moment, every hygienist, ergonomist, etc., that's what we're looking for. We, so, we know that the risk is there. The risk of dehydration is going to cause heat illness. So now we have to address how can we measure that environment and assess that risk. So by far the most important two things is dry we must be able to measure the dry bulb or, if you like, air temperature. And the other more important, and I repeat, more important measure, as I'm sure that you all appreciate, is going to be wet bulb. Wet bulb is the same as relative humidity. Uh, for hygienists that are listening to this, we measure wet bulb. We understand it as being wet bulb. And it's basically the temperature at which water will evaporate. So once you get to about 30 degrees uh, wet bulb, it's going to be something like a saturated environment, which means that you won't get the sweat evaporating from your skin into that environment because it is saturated. So the wet bulb measurement is essential, as is air temperature. But it tells us very little about the actual environment. We all know that. If it says 35 degrees in Perth, it's 32 today in Perth but it tends to be quite a dry air. If you've got 30 degrees in Broome or Kununurra up there, but the wet bulb temperature can be 25, 28 degrees, or if you like, convert that into 90%, 95% humidity. But that environment in Broome is far more hostile than what it will be in Perth at 5 degrees dry bulb higher. So wet bulb is a, an extremely important measurement. Okay, radiant heat. Radiant heat is also extremely important. We know that dry bulb is always measured underneath a tree or in the shade. It's not measured in direct sunlight. Sunlight is going to cause radiant heat. Radiant heat is electromagnetic radiation and it works in the same way as your convection um, microwave. In other words, that it's, it's, if you put your hand into a microwave, it will cook you but you won't feel it as being hot like you do a conventional stove. And that's because it's electromagnetic radiation rather than uh, uh, a dry bulb temperature. So radiant heat is another essential 
parameter of the environment that we must measure. And by far, particularly we know here, yesterday it was certainly uh, occurring, and that's the Fremantle Doctor, wind speed. And uh, anybody that listens to cricket or is involved in sport, Western Australia, we all sit and wait for the Fremantle Doctor to come in at around about 12 o'clock. And we all start feeling a whole lot better when it does happen. My point is, wind speed is essential to measure in the environment in order to assess the thermal strain on human beings working. So dry bulb, wet bulb, radiant heat, wind speed are all essential to measure. Any algorithm index that doesn't measure all of those parameters is not worth doing. The other factors that can impact are going to be personal uh, protective equipment. So clothing is going to add Heat stress, if you're a fireman, for example, that's the extreme example. But anybody that's doing welding that is going to be uh, have equipment and clothing that is going to cause a heat load. So again, we should be able to assess the amount of clothing, which uh, again, for the hygienists and ergonomists, we know that has been a clo factor. So the clo factor of the clothing that the workers are wearing is going to be quite important. Uh, so therefore we've, we've come to the fact that we now have to measure the dry bulb, wet bulb, radiant heat, wind speed, assess the amount of clothing that the person's got and saying, okay, that's their heat load. Now what is the, how can we assess that in the environment in order to uh, measure or effectively uh, do the risk assessment? There are many indexes. The most common, and everybody's familiar with WBGT, WBGT does not measure wind. It measures radiant heat, dry bulb, and wet bulb. It was formulated by the Navy in 1949. We don't use DC3s anymore, and we shouldn't be using WBGT. It doesn't measure wet bulb, and if, oh, sorry, it doesn't measure wind speed, and if we were to take the international guidelines, 90% of mines in Australia would have to stop work if we were to take WBGT literally and, um, and go by the international standard, we would close down 90% of mines in Australia during summer. So effectively, it's not appropriate. TWL is an algorithm that uh, was formulated a few years ago. It has been assessed and peer reviewed and it has been trialled in laboratory conditions and found to be valid. Now remember that muscle efficiency, when we talked about muscle work, uh, we said that 90% of the energy is going as heat energy. The important thing about that is that as you exercise, and the greater the exercise load, the greater the heat energy. And TWL, or thermal work limit, calculates the work capacity. Now, that means that it's basically saying, <coughs> excuse me, that you can do this amount of work in a measured environment. So it's going to measure the dry bulb, the wet bulb, the radiant heat, and the wind speed, it's then going to take a measurement every second in two minutes, so 120 readings, and it will display the level of work that you can perform in that measured environment. Now the amount of work that you can perform is measured in watts per metre squared. Now what you're doing now, by sitting down and just maintaining your spine in an upright position, is around about 115 watts per metre squared. So what we're doing now is 115 watts per metre squared. That's the amount of heat, metabolic heat, that we are generating. Metabolic heat. So we are effectively measuring, when you're looking at some of the hygienists will say, well, wait a minute, WBGT measures metabolic rate. Well, this is the metabolic rate. So we are taking account of the metabolic rate. So the figure, the output, 
of TWL is the metabolic rate that you can perform in that measured environment. I hope that that's clear. So it is a metabolic rate and we are saying that you can do this amount of work in that measured environment. Now if you can't do anything more than 115 watts per meter squared, <clears throat> you may as well go home. The productivity is going to be nil. So a high TWL means better working conditions. So if we've got 300 watts per meter squared, that's really good. We can go for it. If we've got a very low TWL, that means poor up working conditions. So TWL measures environmental conditions. It's a metabolic limit measured in watts per meter squared that can be tolerated. And if you exceed that limit, then you'll get heat storage because you can't dissipate it. So remember that watts per meter squared is the metabolic rate and that's what TWL measures is watts per meter squared that can be tolerated. If you exceed that level of work, then you will get heat storage. TWL will measure all of your clothing, so it takes into account the clothe factor and it can be altered. Most of the instruments like the Scarlet that um, Airmet are the suppliers of, it can be altered, but there is a set point that, uh, that has got a clo factor of approximately 0 0.5, 0 0.6, which is most representative of miners and industrial workers in Australia. It can be used, TW, well, for work recycling. So it will tell you if you exceed, if, or if it's less than 115 watts per metre squared, then it will give you a work recycling. So it will say, okay, you can work for 45 minutes, and then you have to rest for 15. So it'll give you a work rest cycling. If you have to stay in an environment, so you're an electrician, there's a loss of power to the mine, you have to have the electrician go in there, it will give you a maxim maximal duration in that environment, and then you have to leave and stay out. So it will do that. As I said before, it's been scientifically validated, and it's got very, very simple um, outputs. For example, 115 or less is a stop work situation. So once you can do less or can't do any more than what we're doing now, then it's basically a work rest cycling situation. 115 to 140 buffer zone. People that are unacclimatized could be compromised in that environment. So that we call that a buffer zone. Anything above 140 to 220 watts, you're good to go. Those figures came from a PhD student who was working with a doctor at Mount Isa. We had 240 cases of heat illness in a year. Nobody above, when we went down the mine when they reported ill, we went down the mine, measured the environment. We never found one case where it was above 140 watts where you got heat illness. So that's where that came from. It's not something that we've plucked out the air. It's all scientifically validated. Um, we've got a chart there that basically shows work rest cycling uh, that can occur. So where you've got the red zone there, less than 115, it will give you a work rest cycling. So if you're doing light work, for example, 45 minutes, 15 minutes rest. If you're doing heavy work, 20 minutes of work and then 40 minutes of rest. So it can, the chart has been calculated by doing multiple trials of looking at uh, TWL and coming up with a basic figure, which means that you don't have to calculate it yourself. Self-pacing, what is it? Uh, here's a TWL. Now that's a heart rate take, sorry, it's a TWL and heart rate taken from uh, uh, workers in the Middle East, not in Australia, they're working in the Middle East and they have a fairly long lunch break there, and you can see the heart rate when they get to lunchtime. But you can see the important thing is, or the thing that I'm talking about, or pointing out here, is that the heart rate remains relatively stable. If you see there, uh, it's about 100 beats per minute. So the person is working at 100 beats per minute. But if we look at the next slide, we've got TWL changes over that same period of time. And you can see the TWL is going from, um, on one side, on the right-hand side, 
side of the slide, you'll see TWLs going from 250 down to around about 160. And then it goes up again in the afternoon. So as the day warms up, up the TWL, the wind is less, radiant heat goes up, and the TWL it goes down. But the heart rate is staying relatively stable. And that's the point that we're showing here. TWL is going to change. The heart rate is remaining relatively stable at 100 beats per minute. The point that we're making here is that people will self-pace. So as the environment becomes very much harder, harsher, the person slows down to accommodate for that. So self-pacing is an extremely important component uh, in the workplace. Okay, so our conclusions are that hypo or dehydration is the major cause of heat illness in the workplace. No question of that. Fluid replacement is essential, not only fluid but sufficient fluid to maintain blood levels. Sodium is essential to replace. And if the diet is not appropriate, so for example, I've been around most of the mines in Australia to know that people will tend to sleep in until 10 to 6, jump out of bed, throw on some clothes and take off to the bus to go to work. So they're not having breakfast and they're not having sufficient fluid. Remember that they're going to be dehydrated when they get up because they've lost a significant amount of fluid overnight, up to half a litre, just from breathing. So when you get up in the morning, it is the most important time to start drinking fluids to get your blood levels up and also to replace having breakfast to replace or to optimise those electrolytes because if you drink water and no electrolytes, then you're going to dilute that electrolyte concentration and possibly get yourself into the zone of hyponatremia. Urine SG is a good test for uh, looking at the hydration status of workers and um, TWL is a valid and scientifically valid index that I would suggest that you have a look at. I'm now going to pass you over to Ben Tarbox. He's going to talk about fluids and the importance of them and what to, uh, what fluids are most appropriate. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully you, uh, you found that really interesting. A uh, very important topic, uh, particularly as we go into the, the summer months. Listen, when we talk about hydration, um, the two key things or one of the key things that we're, we're interested in is what the outcomes for an organisation are. Um, and primarily we talk about improved productivity and, and output for that organisation. So there needs to be a tangible benefit associated with the, the organisation um, or the company around why they put in good hydration strategies for their workers. Um, the way in which we you know, look at improving that productivity is through improved work rate or performance of the workers. In other words, their self-pacing through the day is at a higher rate than if they are dehydrated and they drop their work performance down. The other is in the, the prevention of heat stress, which Graham would have um, highlighted there, and the effects of dehydration um, and its relationship to that. We know um, with the dehydration of performance, one to two percent dehydration in a in a, a worker or an athlete uh, will result in six to seven percent decrease in work rate. Uh, three. 4% dehydration up to 20 to 50% decrease in work rate. Obviously that 20 to 50% is a range. Uh, people will respond in different ways. But you can see that if we allow our workers to um, dehydrate uh, to even small amounts, then the work performance that they can um, uh, output into a particular day is significantly reduced. Importantly, we also know that mental performance begins to decrease at around 2% dehydration. and you, you level that in with a bit of fatigue and that can really increase the risk of injuries in the workplace. Uh, particularly late morning um, where the blood glucose is starting to drop if they've had a good breakfast and around 10 or 11 o'clock just before they get into lunch, if blood glucose starts to drop down, they get a little bit of fatigue, a little bit of dehydration, um, not quite as cognitively sharp as what they started the day in 
And that can certainly predispose people to injury in and around that time. The other way in which we try and improve outcomes for the, uh, the organisation or the company um, and productivity is the, through the prevention of heat stress. Now, I do want to highlight that it's a multifaceted approach to the prevention of heat stress or heat illness. Um, you know, your general medical uh, health screenings of your workers, uh, environmental monitoring, uh, work practices and scheduling, and hydration plays a key role in helping to prevent uh, the heat stress. In addition, and you would have um, you know, picked up on the points that Graham mentioned earlier around the, the acclimation, bringing workers into an environment, you need to ensure that they are appropriately, appropriately acclimatised to that environment over a number of days. Um, you hear it all the time around athletes will go to elite competitions early to acclimatise to both um, uh, altitude but also heat. Uh, the same applies to the work that's coming in from a cold environment like Tasmania going to the northern uh, parts of WA. They need to be uh, integrated over a period of time into those new environmental conditions. Living in travel conditions, we've talked about the, um, the effects of uh, air conditioning and the relatively, relatively, relative humidity there and also education of workers around the potential uh, threats associated with heat and working in the heat and the, the mechanisms around mitigating those response. So hydration is very much a part of a, a multifaceted approach but it is a absolutely critical part. What I want to talk to you about now is a little bit around why we would recommend electrolyte uh, solutions or electrolyte drinks to use as part of your hydration strategy. We know through research that if people drink water alone, they will not drink enough throughout the day to match the losses that they incur throughout that period of time. So electrolyte drinks improve the palatability of the, the drink or the fluid, thereby encouraging people to drink more than they would otherwise. We know that through the inclusion of sugar and salt that you get an increased absorption rate of the fluid from the gut into the body and therefore that encourages people to drink more and more fluid through that day. We know that fluid is retained in the body more effectively because it helps to maintain the electrolyte balances. And with a little bit of sugar, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about this in a second, a little bit of sugar in the drink is good, not too much but a little bit is good because it helps to maintain those blood glucose levels um, more steadily or at a steady rate throughout the day. If you have something which is very high in sugar, you're going to get a high um, insulin spike uh, and that's going to um, you know, give you the highs and lows of your blood glucose, which is something that you're not necessarily after. Why Apolite? So obviously we have a, a product out on the market there which um, is for consideration from a, a number of people. But one of the key things around Aqualite is its osmolarity. Most of you will uh, know through the promotion of sports drinks that um, initially a lot of the drinks were hypertonic which means that the concentration or the osmolarity of the solution, the thickness of the solution was uh, thicker than that of the fluid in the blood. We know that um, isotonic is a fluid which has similar concentrations to, to that of the blood and we also know that something which has got slightly less solutes um, or slightly less osmolarity is a hypotonic solution. Now a hypotonic solution is a slightly thinner uh, fluid and therefore it is more actively transported from the gut into the blood much faster than what it is um, if it's either isotonic or hypertonic. Okay? So one of the key things that you need to be aware of is the more things that you put in, into a solution, sugar, salt, uh, magnesium, calcium, uh, vitamin C, whatever the case may be, the more you put in, the thicker that you're making that solution and the slower that solution will absorb from the gut into the blood. 
I challenge you to go and um, drink a high volume of very uh, sweet drinks. You know, um, let's say a Powerade or you know your, your carbonated soft drinks, which are very high in sugar. You can only drink small amounts because it basically gets into your gut and it stays there. That's not what we're after. We want a hypertonic solution, which is light and easily and readily absorbed from the gut into the blood, so that the workers can consume more and more, keeping up their fluid intake to match their sweat rates throughout the day. So I'll show you a table in a minute, but what I want to point out is that Aqualite has, uh, is composed of um, an appropriate levels of glucose. Um, it enables or it makes this solution a hypertonic solution, which maximises the fluid absorption rates um, from the the gut to the blood, encouraging consumption. The key there is that people can drink enough of it to match their sweat rates. As soon as they're sweating more than what they're consuming, they're going to become dehydrated and they're going to have those performance and heat-related illness um, risks. It helps to delay the onset of fatigue through uh, a small amount of glucose in the, in the fluid. And it helps to avoid weight gain and that other health-related issues because it doesn't have as high a concentration of sugar as what a lot of the other drinks might contain. We have a, a correct electrolyte balance. It doesn't have anything else other than sodium, potassium and some glucose. Uh, the key to that is keeping less in the fluid means that it becomes a hypertonic solution. We know that you don't lose anything else in, uh, in sweat, uh, therefore you don't need to replace anything else in the fluid itself. It's less acidic, uh, therefore it helps with the oral hygiene and taste, and it's non-caffeinated, uh, knowing that caffeine uh, will increase your metabolic rate and it is a diuretic, we want to stay away from that as much as possible. One of the things that we, we, we like to do is just quite a scientific, rational comparison of uh, the different drinks out on the market and what concentrations they have with carbohydrates, sodium and potassium and compare that to what the recommended concentrations are in, um, in a particular fluid, which has been scientifically uh, rationalised um, through a number of departments. So you can see with Aqualite we've got about 3.7 grams of uh, carbohydrates, 28 milligrams of sodium and 12 grams of potassium. Um, one of the comparisons you might look at are some of the very high carbohydrate drinks on the market um, from 7.6, uh, 7.4 uh, milligrams or sorry, grams per 100 mils, okay? Way too high, very sweet drinks. Um, you'll consume them, you'll get about 600 mils into the body and it will just sit in your gut for a period of time. Therefore, it will make you not drink as much fluid as the lower carbohydrate content drinks. You also will need to look at some of the sodium um, concentrations. The recommended concentration is 23 to 46 milligrams um, per 100 mil. You can see again that a number of uh, options that you might have are very, very high and or very, very low. So you're wanting something which optimises the, uh, the balance between making something a hypertonic solution which encourages absorption into the body and encourages the consumption of fluid. One of the things I think most people need to, to, to do in, when they're looking at different electrolyte options options is to take a really uh, scientific and rational approach. There's a lot of marketing out there, um, some of it's really dubious. Uh, Aqualite is very much based on published research, uh, which is available on the Point Health well website, um, very much developed as a part of trying to address the issues in heat-related illness and dehydration. It's a hypertonic solution, which is low in sugar and less acidic, therefore encouraging um, greater volumes to be consumed throughout the day and we're happy to make objective comparisons to other products based on good science. Um, we've noticed that uh, one of the greatest uh, marketing uh, 
um, activities that we can do is to get people to try Aqualite. The user experience is, is absolutely critical. People need to enjoy something for them to, uh, to uh, continue to use it. Um, once people have used Aqualite, uh, they tend to retain their you know, use of it over a period of time. The one thing I would say is that um, Western palates are very much developed or they're, they're accustomed to very sweet drinks. Um, they're, very, they're accustomed to very sweet foods. With Aqualite, it's because of the slightly lower concentration of sugar. The first time that you do taste it, it is a, a feeling of all that feel, tastes a little bit weak. So it needs two or three user experiences for them to get to use and it will get to become familiar and to adjust their palates to uh, a fluid which will encourage consumption but not add too much sugar into the daily intake. So palatability is very important. Um, with the lower sugar intake, what you don't get is that sort of tacky sort of taste on your uh, on, on the back of your mouth when you consume lots of high sugar drinks. Um, and importantly, and I mentioned it before, hydration is very much a multifaceted approach to the prevention of heat illness and Aqualite forms part of that solution. Uh, it's not the only uh, critical variable part of it, but you need to take a very balanced approach and it needs to be integrated into an overall strategy. How much fluid in a day is enough? Um, Graham in his presentation talked about the, the average sweat loss of about 600 mils per hour. Therefore, over the course of a 10-hour you know, a, a day, you are looking up to six litres of fluid that you need to replace. How do you do that? Listen, any strategy that a company can put in which encourages a, a worker to drink is a good strategy. You know, if you look at six litres a day, or in, in some instances even more, we know that some uh, workers and some athletes can actually sweat up to one litre an hour. So you put that over a 10 hour day, then you know, you're know you potentially looking at 10 litres of fluid that you need to replace. But what needs to be encouraged is around the clock um, hydration processes before, during and after work. Critically, and Graham again discussed, that a lot of workers will turn up prior to the day in a dehydrated state. Therefore, anything that you can do to encourage them to get up and start drinking appropriately is absolutely critical. Having good work practices so that they drink enough during the day is critical. And then encourage them after work to drink good fluids, not a couple of beers at the pub, will help them to prepare for the following day. A couple of alcohol, you know, a couple of beers at the end of the day basically dehydrate, dehydrates them. They work, wake up the next day, you know they're dehydrated from the start. It's then a rolling issue or a, a recurring issue of them being compromised. Anything you do needs to uh, that encourages drinking needs to be easily accessible and encouraged. Uh, you need to look at your, your personal protective equipment, providing them with drink bottles, for example having drink containers um, available throughout the workplace or having defined drink stations. And one of the key areas that we also need to look at is ensuring that the workers are educated around the importance of our hydration and what they need to do to remain hydrated throughout the day. Thanks very much, Ben and Graham. Um, just for the audience, Ben and Graham have been um, working from the same computer, so of course the first first presentation was done by by Graham Graham Bates, and that was just Ben. Now.